So let's look at, let's boot up FreeCAD, the open source uh, parametric modeling software. In terms of what's out there, that is the option I would say. It's an active development. As far as the functionality goes, there's other ones that are out there are OpenSCAD, which is parametric. It's more from command line. There's other ones, for example, BlocksCAD, which I like. And that is basically an interface on top of the OpenSCAD. So it's actually very easy. You drag and drop. I want to show you maybe if I can <clears throat> take a look at that. It's called uh, so BlocksCAD. I do want to show you this one because this one is very useful for 3D printing kind of stuff. If you have a STL file, which stands for stereolithography, you can modify it in this. And it's you can go either FreeCAD or this. Uh, it's a web interface, so it's very it's very user friendly. You don't need to install anything here. And uh, it's got 3D shapes. So you basically, the idea is you drag and drop things. And you can add them one on top of each other. It's a visual programming environment. So you could do like, take a difference between two shapes or sum and such. But you got to render in there. So you, it'll show up whatever you're rendering. And then you export it. Very useful because you can like, you know, say you got to modify something, you want to poke a hole in a thing in your coupler that you don't have a hole in, you want an extra hole. Um, so here's an example of something that just got rendered. You can increase that size and all that. So I just, so for example, if you drag in, a, you know, a cylinder, like, say, 50, um, do that you got a render so that's the only thing you just got to update the rendering but other than that very good recommended so yeah it gave me this cylinder here so or that maybe that one in the middle so yeah that whatever so okay good to know other than that FreeCAD is our main programming uh, well main CAD platform and it's useful because it's open source we can make any modifications to it as we like if a functionality doesn't exist you dream it up we can do it you can also do webgl uh, which that functionality is not great within FreeCAD but you could do webgl imports where you export a code that can be embedded readily in 3d inside a wiki for example so webgl is a language that allows you to render things within a browser so you don't have to have any software and then you can manipulate it in 3d which is very useful so that's a fully open source route to do that one guy on our team is also uh, doing a WebGL explosions for a lot of our things. Like, for example, the universal axis itself, it's been exported to WebGL. So let's go to universal axis to show you what universal, uh, sorry, to show you what WebGL rendering looks like within the wiki. And what we're doing there is we have little sliders. So that's a little bit of programming on top of that. We've got a slider that explodes the things or hides parts and annotates. So um, the rendering, I want to go to the rendering. That's a snapshot of the rendering, but here's the rendering. Okay, WebGL right here. It's going to take some time to load. Do, are people uh, suckling on the internet here? because it's not showing up. <clears throat> it, it may show up. It's This is... just wanted to show you how you can rent, just manipulate it in 3D and you have a slider to explode it, which is a great teaching tool. If you've got a complex thing and you want to see it's all its insides, the exploded part diagram is a very useful thing. You can label things. We'll, we'll come back to this. It may load up here. But now, let's dive into FreeCAD. So click on the FreeCAD. This is version 16 I'm using here. And I'm not using OSE Linux because most people aren't using it, or half, half and half. So I'm also recording. So 
that's how the start page looks like. So, so you just need to know a few things in order to manipulate work with FreeCAD effectively. So first of all, you got to start a new document. So click the plus. It gets you the nice blue screen. So that's step number one to remember. Sometimes you might come to this. It's like, hey, where, where, what do I do here? Well, start with a screen. Uh, start with a new document. What you have in the left-hand side is a project tree where it's just an unnamed file, so there's nothing in there. So the workflow within FreeCAD that I'd like to describe, and I'll just stick to this, is um, there's many functions in there, but just stick to this one thing and you'll be set for very many things. And it's the sketcher followed by padding and making holes. So like so sketcher followed by extrusions. Extrusions either positive or negative. Negative extrusion means you poke a hole in something so you can draw things in 2D and then take them into the third dimension simply by taking them, them out. Sketcher. So Sketcher is going to have your basic functionalities of all kinds of different, uh, different things. So, but first you need to start a document. So this is the key. Like, okay, none of these are highlighted yet. You got to start a document. It's going to ask you for a plane. So select XY plane. So you're going to be drawing on XY. That means extrusion is going to be into Z. There. Now you see all the, the buttons here showed up. You've got points, lines, curves, circles, polylines, squares, polygons. So like a hex Remember the little hex driver tool, the little black tool handle? Uh, you can draw that directly with that, that hex right there. Can you, uh, right there. The of size yep. Yep. These are the stock choices. <laughs> Triangle, square, pentagon, hexagon, heptagon, octagon. But of course, anyone who goes into Python can add more here. So. FreeCAD is fully extensible, programmable. This is running in Python. So like you can readily add Decagon or whatever and make that work. OK. So very simple things. Whoever's got it, wh whoever's running it, you know, points, points. And I show this in my, my five minute super dense video. Uh, just for reference on that, there's a page called FreeCAD 101. Uh, okay, since things may not be loading, there's FreeCAD 101 page. There's two five-minute videos that I did. I go through all this, just a very quick five-minute summary of what we're doing here, but here we're just going to go in a little slower pace. Okay, points. Nothing to it. Draw a point. Okay, lines. Nothing to it. You can draw lines. Arcs. So say... Uh, don't worry about arcs. Let's do circle for now. Circles. So it actually allows you to draw a circle like that. So you can do like a partial circle. Or you can do a regular circle like center and rim point, which is going to be just a plain circle. Okay. Polylines. Useful. So you know you got whatever you got to draw. Your shape and then you close it on itself. So you got this. Right. <laughs> Sketcher workbench. New document. Plane. If you remember those three things, you can get to here. But since you have to remember those three things, that's impossible for some people already. So you got. If you know this, you're good. <laughs> then you select whichever shape. So so simple. Uh, zoom in and out with the mouse. So let's say number four. Let's talk about navigation. So navigation styles fit selection. I think I got it. This is in Sketcher where I'm active editing, right? So to get out of that, you got to hit close. Now these are not, you can select them, but you cannot edit them. So now the sketch appeared in your tree view. 
So this is object oriented, so everything that you do appears in a, as an item. Now because I did it as one edit, that all went into that one sketch. That's my sketch. If I do a new sketch, so I gotta click again, the XY plane, do another sketch, I'll do another one, you know, put my square here, then close, then it goes this to this other sketch. I can I can edit the name. No, I went to edit sketch, rename. So square. That's useful if you want to do things, uh, label things, keep track of things. You can do a lot of organizations through this tree view, and you can also ex export bills of materials. So, if, for example, if you if you put a name there with like even a price, you can one cheap way to do a bill of materials that you can export readily from a project is to put the name and maybe like source and price right as the name. And then there's a functionality, there's a there's a spreadsheet workbench here that allows you to do the spreadsheet of everything that you've got in there. So you can generate a complete bill of materials just like that. That's one way as a lowbrow way to get a bill of materials. You've got a thing that's got so many parts. Typically it's a big process. You know, you take it one by one, go into a spreadsheet, that can get you that whole spreadsheet right there. So tree view is very important. Let's go back to the sketcher. So, uh, well, let's not create a new sketch. Let's just double click and that lets you edit that sketch. Now the other sketch, you're not gonna do anything to it because you, you haven't selected it. I selected that one sketch here, okay? So close it. I wanna show the navigation styles though. So you can access navigation styles when you're not, not selected anywhere. So you're, you're out of this, but right mouse button gets you navigation styles. I like gesture which left mouse, right mouse button is moving things, middle mouse button is zooming, and the left and the other one is rotating. So now you're, you're in 3D, you're, you're rotating things. It's, it's cool. It's definitely worth having an external mouse if you're on a laptop. It'll make it a lot easier if you're doing a lot of work with this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't even try this with a mouse or anything. I mean, some people claim they could do it. They're not efficient. I mean... Um, so we kind of, you know, where the plane gets all jumbled up. So you have these boxes here that, are, that show the different views. Like, um, so depending on which view you select, those, those cubic things up there, uh, this third one actually happens to be the XY plane. So you can look at it from any plane. That's useful. Um, which, which buttons do we yeah, so th there's these blue buttons, these ones, the cube, cubic looking things up there. You do the different different views, any plane. So that means if you want to edit this on this side, you can do that. If you want to look at it from the side, you want to look at another side, you do that. Now, measuring tape is cool too. So measuring tape, a very simple tool, just click between two objects and somewhere, it did that into the page. It gets you the, the distance, you know, and you can remove that. You can remove things just by hitting delete on them. So let's go back to a couple more things on a, on a sketch just to show you. So there's the polygon, there's like elliptical things, so good for like bolt holes, very useful. Now nothing is constrained here, so you can move things around. Still you can grab that, uh, you can grab that side. Uh, and then unconstrained sketches, you could do anything to them. Um, so they're going to move around on you. Like I grab this corner here, it's going to move. I grab this side, it's going to move the entire object. Uh, I grab that one point, it should move those two sides. No, it actually, in a square, it moves everything. But if I do, a, for example, a polyline, just observe the behavior because the sketcher tool is very useful for motion analysis. Like say you got a backhoe and you have a sketch that shows, okay, an articulation for a backhoe. You can do things, observe the behavior. Like, for example, if I grab that point, it should move those two lines attached to the point because nothing is constrained. So let's check that. See that? That's cool. That actually can get you very cool motion analysis in a sense like, let's constrain that line, for example, um, and let's constrain that line by saying, okay, how do I fix that? Um, so I selected a couple of things there.
I take that point, that point is a point constraint that fixes that point. Okay, for example. Or let's say, no, I'm going to say, I want to fix this line and that point. You, when you select something, these are all the constraints here. All those light up after you select something. They're not going to appear before, so you have to kind of be aware where you are. So for awareness, where are we now? We're editing a sketch, and we got into constraining of a sketch. So let's close out of here so you know where you're at. Because sometimes it's like, okay, how do I access that? It's not those buttons are, aren't showing up, or I can't edit this sketch. So, so first of all, do the sketch, edit the sketch you want to you edit. That one has like all those points there. This is our second one here. So you're selected. Um, the constraints, the behavior is if you select it, the constraints all appeared. But if you, I clicked on it, they disappeared. So be aware of that. Uh, they just disappeared on you. You're like, well, how do I constrain this? There, none of these things. Well, you have to select something you want to constrain. So let's take this one line and let's, I guess, it will probably fix those two points. Select two or more vertices from the sketch. So it, okay, that's what it told me. So, okay, I want to constrain, let's just constrain that point. Two, two more vert vertices from the sketch. No, the point constraint, I'm sorry, <clears throat> the point constraint takes two points and makes them into one. So, for example, if you, if you draw two lines, uh, the point constraint... I got two points selected. Points gonna connect them. Well, so I, ha I guess I had the third one selected, so they all jumped over there. It jumps to the first point selected. Thing. Okay. <clears throat> so, like, say you got, you know, you drew something and you wanted to touch right next to something. That's useful there. Okay. Let's look at more more constraints. So, very useful ones are, for example, make it vertical. Okay. That. I got a vertical on those two that I selected. Uh, can, let's get this one vertical here. I just got that one selected. Vertical, okay, so it got, got a vertical. Let's make this one horizontal, so this is horizontal, so it straightens that out. Now, what happens when I hit that point? It's, everything is still moving, moving around. Uh, so how do I fix, for example, let's say I want to fix that line. Um, equivalent, perpendicular, symmetric. There's there's a bunch of different ones. Um, my short video talks about more of these. I want to show you like okay, so that this line here got fixed by the so see see how well I'm dragging this yeah. Point is that when you get into simulations of things like, say, you, you got a backflow that you want to design and and you're wanting to see how it moves, if you fixed two lines, so let's maybe do like a poly like polyline out of two lines. That's my or like say three lines. Um, Let's take that point. Okay, so there's, see, there's just a different behavior you have to get used to. But on that polyline, you can't move it. Or I don't know why I'm not being able to move it around. But let's take a look at that. Now I'm not able to move them around, and I think it's because I got this somehow. I I don't know how I got this vertical constraint here. But I'm selecting that constraint, so you can delete the constraints here. Point, my point is not moving. So this might, we actually might have run into a crash already because I'm not able to move things right now. Yeah. Okay, so keep it clean. Like once you get enough jumble and I just put a bunch of random stuff, maybe some constraint here, that's a crash already. So, okay, let's, let's close that. Let's close that file. Um, so the key is that you just play with a whole bunch of stuff, observe the behavior, and understand that you can draw lines and then uh, constrain them in various ways. So to give you a, 
you know, like a simple example, if people want to follow this, you know, cancel that. So I'm going to just cancel out of the air. Close without saving. We don't need that. Gets you to the start screen. Start a new one. So let's do, let's design the, you know, the bit holder that we did yesterday uh, as a simple example. Let's get into extrusions. So first of all, do X, Y plane. Yes. Yeah. So let's say if you have a diagram and you want to specify the length of it. Yeah. My frustration with it was uh, once I go into the editing uh, yeah. mode, the the length part becomes dis disabled. Huh. Interesting. Let's very very important thing here is measuring lengths. Like you, you got to draw an object that you know the dimensions of. Like for example, you've got the some of the 3D printer pieces. You want to draw it. You know it has certain sides. So let's let's do that. Uh, say let's start with a polyline thing. So you know you can draw freehand like this, or you can draw a square. But freehand, everything is mobile here. So say so for, say we drew it freehand. First of all, like make them horizontal. That one I already kind of drew horizontal. Make that one vertical. Make this one vertical. And now we want to constrain some lengths because now these points, okay, these points still move. So you can constrain them by selecting a length. So now look at, there's also, there's a little tab here. So see there's more stuff there. So you want to move it so you see them all. You can kind of drop, drag and drop things. So these here, okay, so the lock thing was what I, and that's, I mean, I got confused. I didn't see the lock thing. I wanted to lock a point so that you can move things around that point. So let's actually uh, show you that for the backhoe simulate. Control Z to delete it. I'm deleting that constraint, so now I can move it again. It's not, observe that behavior. So if I lock that constraint, if I move that point now, that point moves parallel. So there's a lot of power to these very basic constraint things. OK, let's take a look at length. Uh, so I select a line, because that's for length. And this is the horizontal length. So it takes you, OK, let's make it 5 inches. You can edit that length. So what issue did you run into? So when you move that point, the whole, whole square should move, or at least those parts, because that length is constrained. Okay, so the workflow that we propose for this is to keep things as simple as possible because of the bugginess, but also to keep a you know keep a very clear workflow based on parts. So as soon as you, what I like to do is is use the workflow where as soon as you have something like say we do this thing, you know say we got a three dimensional shape, save it as a part in a part library, and I'll show this, and then there's a workflow where you simply merge. It's called merge, but it's under file. So under file, um, there's import, export, merge project, and it's not appearing because I'm in edit mode. So once again, this is awareness where you are. Before you do anything, close that. So I go to file, merge project. That is the key workflow. Merge means you're merging another FreeCAD file. Not not exporting or importing. The file that you're importing is still separate, right? It's separate. Yeah. But the way to keep a document clean and get away from troubles, like, because just for your, like, own sanity, too, and, and FreeCAD gets confused very easy, because if you don't have things constrained properly, the, the thing that they recommend is constrain absolutely everything. So once you have a drawing, there's zero degrees of freedom. And it'll show you in that, that box, it shows you how many constraints you have, which things you can move, which means a degree of freedom. So go ahead. Is there an editor for, like, say you have, say I merged in a sphere yeah. into my project. Yeah. Can I select the sphere and go into a merged project editor or something like that? Or do I have to open the no, you, tool library? Well, I mean, you can open that thing you merged right there by clicking on it. Like you or, it up. yes, a useful thing is if you're designing, say, a 3D printer and you replaced the extruder, that's where the merge functionality is very useful because you drew up, say you have the CAD from elsewhere, just merge it into the document. That is key. 
So don't try to do like, okay, I'm going to do this one master big file for the 3D printer because first it's going to get heavy. It's going to get many megabytes, uh, depending on how you do things. So merging individual parts is a very much recommended workflow. And I do would say it's consistent with the modular design principles, lets you keep track of things. If you want to borrow that part elsewhere, you already have it in a library. So please do that. Um, export and import, those are two things you, you want to know. So STL files or step files. For example, as I mentioned, McMaster car has step files for everything that it carries, mostly, mostly everything it carries. So you can get borrow like a like a valve, three-way valve or something. You're using that in your tractor or something. Borrow that, export, import it. Import it as a step file. Let's see if, if the let's go to McMaster car just to show you that. Uh, because McMaster car is where we get a lot of parts and, and that's a like a big general supply, industrial supply thing. So I would say like if you're looking to build something, look at McMaster car first. Uh, so say, you know, you search a product like a valve, like a, where's that search box? I can't see it. Uh, there. So, you know, take a valve of some sort. You, you want to add that to your CAD. Okay, so on off valves. <clears throat> I mean, it has tons and tons of stuff. So when it has this CAD symbol there, it says it, it you can find that as a CAD model. You kind of have to know how to navigate it. So for example, go to this specific quarter by quarter inch valve for $8, and then it goes into product de detail with a CAD symbol. And there it's going to be. It's going to have the CAD drawing. So for example, you can take this CAD drawing. You can actually import images into FreeCAD. So for example, you can put that in your background and actually draw over this in FreeCAD. Let's not get into that. But here, what I wanted to show is that, okay, 3D step. Step file is what you want. FreeCAD imports it. So the different choices you have are eDraw, IGES, PDF, DSAT, SOLIDWORKS. SOLIDWORKS step. So SOLIDWORKS is a proprietary format. DSAT, I don't know what that is. PDF is going to be probably this PDF drawing. IGES is going to be 3, 3D. E drawing, I don't know what that is. But step is a three dimensional one. Step or IGES are importable into FreeCAD readily, like that. So, so simply download it, save it. Uh, so it saves it. Did that do it there? No. So, so then you can import it into FreeCAD. And this is for various sources. There's various online repositories, like GrabCAD is a big repository of, open, of various designs under different licenses. But yeah, any decent manufacturer should have a full CAD file. If they don't, you should call them up and say, hey, where's your CAD file? Uh, some will give it to you. Others who are more proprietary will not. Uh, like you probably, we'd love to have a en full engine file from Briggs & Stratton, for example, for the power cubes, but they probably will not give it to you because if it's a fu full file, it allows you to replicate it. Uh, so it's a powerful thing. A, a, a fully detailed CAD file is very valuable because it took that design digital, which means that it's infinitely replicable if you have the means to replicate it. Um, but here, McMaster car has all these. These are stock, off-the-shelf, industrial parts. So let's, let's say I want to import that. File import. Import. Uh, select the file. So that, this is the one I just downloaded here, this ball valve. So open that and it should get you in there. And it's probably got the threads in there, which are probably going to take a lot of memory. I mean, it's taken a little bit to import it. So that thing is probably sizable, like probably a megabyte or more. I just want to get the info on it just to show you. Because you have to pay attention to memory <laughs> size. Like, Okay, so there's my valve that I just imported. Isn't that great? And it's, so, it's, so it's fully, you know, you can now 3D print it, for example. You can uh, go to file export. 
and you can do SDL file as a selection. So that's how you would you select it, export it as an SDL, and that's ready for 3D printing. So you could do like a if you want to 3D model your power cube. Well, we could do a, like a little scale model of this and print it out and use it as an actual model. You could even print the threads and probably even thread in stuff like that. So it's, it's very powerful. It's a full full uh, reverse engineering workflow. So I won't go into that. But I just want to show the memory size of that properties. And that thing is, yeah, exactly one megabyte. So that means if you've got a few of these in there, the file is going to get pretty heavy really fast. Like the limit that I would recommend is like 10, 20, 30, maybe 30 megabytes. But after that, you, you know, it starts to slow down quite a bit unless you have a more powerful computer like with a GPU or something where then it will prob probably still work really fast. But on a regular laptop, like this, the practical limit for what you want to work with is like, I would say 10 megabytes. So, so everything is really fast. Beyond that, you're just, you know, it takes time to render and stuff like that, so not recommended. But what, what we like to do is after we have a, like say we got a file like this and it's one megabyte and we know we have five of these in our power cube, we say, okay, I, I don't want to put like five megabytes right into these little valves when there's hundred, they say there's a hundred components. So we would, we would do a file simplification procedure actually. So we would just take this and just draw it in FreeCAD. Like, so, so what we could do, for example, um, you know, you take it to a, to a proper view, like from this head on part, right? So I would just reverse engineer it in FreeCAD. I would say, okay, let's draw it in FreeCAD because in FreeCAD native, for example, there's probably threads in there. If you look in there, there's threads. They take a lot of memory. Uh, strip the threads. So uh, what I would do here, you can basically draw it using that as a template. So you go into that plane, whichever that plane was, and then, uh, so that's the XY plane, actually. I lost myself. Where am I? So I want to go to that sketch was in that that direction. I think I need like I think I probably need an XY plane. So sketch, new sketch, XY. That's right. It got positioned on the on the XY plane. So I would go here and I just take my you know to make it look nice. I'll I'll just go. Well, I mean we, the polygon is easy to do. So I would start at the center. You kind of have to know how far you went. So you, I'm going to go to that corner about, okay, there. So close it. <clears throat> and I'm going to make this, this thing disappear by hitting, hitting a button. So the cool thing about a basic workflow of FreeCAD is you can hide and unhide things by clicking on something and pressing space bar. You can literally, so, so you know, you got this valve here. You can select part, part by part to expose the build structure of an, a very complex thing. That's one way to do instructionals is when you just hide, hide part by part. Like for example, with a brick press, we did that. Uh, to do a fabrication procedure on it, we would just take, you know, put in the first part or like take the whole brick press, take off one part, the next part, next part, until you're to like one part and then reverse the order of that and that's a build procedure, right? So that's one way to, to simply do that. If you for example, if you video record that procedure of stripping one part after another and then play it in reverse, well, that's like a build procedure. Okay, so I just want to show like, so that's one megabyte. And so we're talking about memory issues and that's part of the memory issues is you're in a design jam environment. You can't be waiting around to people for people to get frustrated. You want it to be snappy and clear. So in this case, I would definitely turn this from one megabyte to like 10K, 5K. So just to show you that as an example also of the of the sketcher workbench, I'm going to go back to my sketch here that I did. Um, I'm going to hide my, hide my valve. So this sketch, so let's talk about the extrusion. So that's, that's sketch number two, right? Um, let's start getting into the extrusions. So the editability of those dimensions, yes, you should be able to click on the dimension like in our uh, former sketch, wherever that was. Okay. Like th this five inches. Double click on it. Make it eight inches. That's all edible and that's useful uh, because you can edit all these kinds of things. 
I can still move this because it's not so constrained. To constrain it, uh, I would go the lock thing. Select one vertex from the sketch other than the origin. So, so the lock works on vertices. So take that sketch, lock it. Okay, so you just locked it. Now you probably can't move this anymore. But can you move these points? Yeah, you can still move these points because that side isn't locked. Just that one point is locked. So, but I like to, like when, when you get into a complex design and you know it's right, I just erase everything just to keep the simplicity in that design and it also takes less memory. So like really strip it down. Because say because you don't you don't delete it, you save the source file. Save save the source, you've got the full file with all the dimensions. If you want to now mess with it, don't get confused. If you know it's right, just might as well strip all the dimensions. If you want to modify something or if you want to uh, if you want to modify a si side par parametrically, add that dimension and then you can double click and change that dimension so you can add all the dimensions back to it anyway I like to strip things so I like to keep things as simple as possible no fluff in a, in a design so here I would go into all my constraints like say somebody did a complex design so I'm talking about here everything from the point of collaborative development you, you just picked up somebody's file okay they got like a hundred constraints you're trying to modify it I don't know what to do. Like, just go into the constraints. Just erase everything. Click on it. Backspace. Um, okay, now I'm erasing my. These are my elements. So don't erase your elements. Erase your constraints. So here's your constraints. So just, you know, get rid of them. Get rid of what you don't need. All. So that's that's flexible. Uh, now everything is back to unconstrained. You can modify it, even the lines split. Oh yeah, they're you know splitting it apart completely. Okay, but let's go back to our. So once again, like okay, where are you here? Well, scroll up to close it, so you make sure you know where you are. It goes back to the sketch. There's a model view, and a tasks view. So make sure you're in the model view. That's another item you have to remember. That's the tree view. It's got all the parts in here. Okay, so I want to reverse engineer that valve. I just drew over the, the one face, uh, and that's sketch number two there. So close out of there. Go into then part design. So the workbench selection is that button up there. You can work in various different workbenches, which will have different tools on top. You're still working with the identical same design. It just allows you maybe to do different things upon that design. So in a part design workbench, it now gave you all these other tools of which the two relevant ones are this one, which is pad a selected sketch. And the second one, which is called create a pocket within a selected sketch. So let's extrude. So this is extrusion. You're, you're making something three dimensional. So now let's take our primitive of this valve. So once again, so do this. Uh, we close out of there, but select it. Don't double click it, but select it. In double click, you're editing it. You cannot do these operations upon things that are being edited. Uh, and probably those symbols should disappear. They got blanked out you got back into Sketcher, which gets you all the constraints and everything. So close out of the edit mode, but select it. So you're selecting things here. Select Sketch 2. Now let's pad it. Okay, it started a pad. Let's make it 5 inches long for length. Okay, there you go. So you just created a three-dimensional thing. Well, I could keep working it. I can do the cylindrical part and so forth. So let's do the cylindrical part. So this is the power of FreeCAD. You can take any side now, and you can draw more things on it, more features on it. Uh, say you want to put a handle on it. Say this is a representation of your valve, uh, and that thing. Let's hide hide the other thing. Yeah. So that thing appeared from McMaster Car in multiple pieces. Like that handle opened up as multiple pieces. Sometimes it, it gets you like one one chunk. Sometimes it gets you multiple pieces. Depends who did the file, how they exported it. Okay, so we've got our, our thing. So I'm, I selected that face, and uh, it's got face tools here. 
I want to go back to uh, so the workflow is that now you can put a sketch on any face to do more stuff and make this into a complicated, much more complicated thing. I select that face. What happens? That asks me to do various face tools. That's not appearing. So I, I got to go back to Sketcher. This is we, where we know we can do all kinds of sketches. So if I'm in Sketcher, I can select that face, and now it should. Uh, let me see. Part design. Did it have the? Did you see the difference? What happened when I went into Sketcher? That thing appeared, which is to put a new new sketch on, and you can put that new sketch anywhere. There's this other one that's that's map a sketch to a face. We don't need to do that. Just use use this one. That's getting a little a little more advanced. <laughs> Just use a face. That's still t you can still put a yep. How to okay. Draw a shape. I, I have a shape yeah. You got a shape. Select it within Tree View. Okay. Don't double click. Then go into Part Design and click the Pad tool. Part Design. Part Design Workbench is the key. So that's got it there. Okay. Did it extrude? Uh, yes. Cool. There. So this is this is easy. Uh, so click on any face, it gets you the, the sketch item, so it automatically takes you to that face when you clicked on it. So we, that looks pretty long. Why is it that long? Is that a bug? You said it to five inches. Oh, okay. No, that's good. So, so okay. Um, now it asks you what plane. If you don't specify a plane, it will ask you what plane do you want to put it to. Now here it only has three planes. In the actual CAD, it has more than three planes. Any face is a plane. So if you select it, like I did, and it turned green there, if you can see that, I'm going to put a sketch on it. So it, it aligns you right to it, gets you right on it, and now let's poke a little hole through that. So let's do our... Oh, say we need a like a put a big bolt through that uh, through this shaft thing okay close it just did it I did this new sketch this is sketch 4 which is selected so let's go back to part design now we're gonna do the pa the the pocket creates a pocket so I'm gonna click that that's it and then it tells you what kind of length like if you want it to be all the way through it just got me here it got me a little bit I want it to be all the way through so let's take uh, like three inches or two inches. So this is cool stuff. Like you can start doing all kinds of things. You can draw features anywhere. Um, you can draw features on internal parts. Like if I if I do another, say a square. So let's do this thing. Well, actually, let's do our bit bit holder. So the bit holder was essentially this with a smaller thing on the inside. Uh, so let's draw on that face. Don't select the whole object, that's two clicks. First click selects that face, which is green now. I'm going to put a, actually this part design has that same tool there actually, it showed up. So now it took me to this face, I'm going to put another hexagon to, to put in a, a hexagonal bit, make it a hexagonal bit holder. So once again do your hexagon, start it at the center. Uh, you can hardly see it there. So if you can hardly see it, uh, you wanna, you can do things like hide the thing you just drew. Because sometimes the color scheme might not be good. So once again, in the tree view, just hit the space button. Now we want to make sure that this, if this is gonna fit a quarter inch bit, let's make this quarter inch size. But let's do maybe things like in the constraints. Let's do make that vertical. So I wanna go into edit of that sketch since it's kind of at an angle, make that vertical. So once again, that, that thing. So there I aligned it. Now, how do we make it 0.25 inches? Let's take two points across and select a horizontal distance between them, 0 0.25 inch. Uh, what's going on? Uh, 0 0.25 inch. So we got that. <coughs> there you go. So that, that would actually hold the bit now. Uh, close it. So now I want to pocket. 
so I know that's sketch number five. I want to pocket what I had before, so let's make the other thing appear. Let's cut this hole out. So I'm I want to just select sketch five. It appears there. Let's off offset a little bit. We can go to sketcher and move it. But I want to pocket. So I got to go back to part design, do the pocket operation. It's going to get you a little pocket, but you want to go all the way through. So it will be uh, in order to make it go all the way through. Select the length to be like 10 inches, whatever. Doesn't matter. So it poked it all the way through, and it's poked poked through that hole. So you see, you get very complex geometries now. Now the the other thing I want to show is orthographic view versus perspective view. Perspective is looks looks better, uh, but it's harder to it's actually harder to get things like on one face because if you say you, you look at it from a particular angle, um, it doesn't look flat to you. Like from the other orthographic view, it looks like a square thing. Now. For example, like look at that thing. This is perspective view. If you go into orthographic view, that's going to look like a square. So it's easier to kind of like analyze it or uh, hit a corner or something like that. So that's kind of like the basic workflow. So if you have this understanding of this basic workflow, I mean, this is really powerful already. Um, we can make features. So, you know, let's just show another one. So select that side, put another item on it like uh, some irregular feature. Okay, that didn't close up on itself, so I want to probably go edit into that sketch. Uh, my screen is kind of small, so I, so I don't have a lot of space here. But that was the last sketch I did, the sketch number six, so let's edit it actually. But I want to hide this other thing because I can't see things. So those points are not aligned. Like you can't pad this thing because it's not closed. So one way to do it, select the two points, make them, make them constrained. So hit the point. Select vertices from the sketch. So I did that. So there and there. And it went to the first point I selected. So now it's a closed shape. It's not constrained or anything like that. Um, but that thing I can pad out, uh, so we can close that. Select that sketch number six and make a make a pad on it. Make it like one inch. So how does my thing look now? You know, we just created that on the side. So you can now, as you see, you can start doing all kinds of crazy stuff. If you have the ability to draw any shape within the sketcher, you can draw just about anything. You can draw like a floor plan of a house that you can then extrude like with all the rooms or whatever. You can do a lot of things. Uh, but it is kind of, it's limited in the sense that you're only going up like one direction, but you can go in different directions depending on as long as you have a face. If you want to do more irregular things, only other thing I can say that's quite useful and very easy is in the part workbench, you have primitive shapes like a cone, a sphere. So, you know, like let's draw a cone. Where did put that cone? Uh, I put a, like a small cone right in there. Uh, that cone there. You've got some basic things that are <clears throat> just one click, but they're still parametric, so you can change the sizes of all the sides and everything like that. Um, but that's the basic workflow that I want to show you. And with this, like for example, the if you take a look at the the 3D printed pieces for the axis, you can do this with this, and you can try it yourself. What, what would you do there? Start with a square. You know you've got the bolt holes for the holes, so that would be holes. You know you've got the nut catchers, like they're hexagonal, so you can catch. Uh, we're actually using round screws, but if, if we used hexagonal screws, um, we could do that. Our holes are hexagonal there, so you could do that. You can do all the magnet holes just by little holes where the magnets are. Uh, so take the carriage piece. Well, how do you do the holders for the bearings in there? How would you do that? Yeah. Yeah, you do. You do it. It depends on what you're doing. Like, if you want something, and it also depends on your printer. If your printer is sloppy, and it might print a little bit in. If you draw a quarter-inch bolt hole. 
you might not fit a quarter inch bolt in there. So you might want to do a quarter inch plus like one sixteenth or something. So you have to consider how well your printer is printing. If your printer is printing with like a 1.4 millimeter tool head uh, extruder, then that discrepancy might be might be large. Um, so it depends what you what you want to do. Um, if you want press fit things, if you want something to be really tight, like a coupler, like for example with the when I printed the hex tool holder, I could not get those in easily by hand, so I actually went to a vise and cranked down on a vise, so it's a press fit against it. If you wanted it to be like a loose thing that can come right on and off, another piece just make it a little larger. And you have to experiment with that a little bit because depending on, say, the shrinkage of the material that you're printing or various physical factors, you might get different results. And the production engineering means documenting all that so it's transparent for everybody else doing. Like, for example, if you say, okay, we've got D3D version 18.08, 0.4 millimeter nozzle, this certain temperature, this material, you say, okay, this is the exact result we're going to get. And we can take data like that, we can say, okay, this is exactly what we get when we do that. That's something that's worth documenting for our production engineering. We want to know exactly what the results we have. Like, for example, we had issues with the, one of the bolt holes where the square square <laughs> nuts were rotating within a square hole. That means somehow the hole got printed a little too large. It may be that uh, it's possible that because I printed it so fast, it got a little bit inaccurate. Because, uh, of course, if you print slower, you're going to be more accurate. If you're printing you, a 2 by 4 you definitely want to print on your fastest speed because you got a lot of material to print and the dimensions aren't critical that you're one millimeter off. So it depends where you are and that's that's the thing that makes you can say 3D printing a little bit challenging because a lot of times you can't just say, oh, I'm just going to download this file and it's going to work. You have to understand what your printer can do. Like for example, if you have a fan, you can bridge overhangs. Say you have one one thing you're printing, two sticks you're printing, you want to bridge over them like to make a table. Um, you know, How far can you go what is that overhang that you can do? In theory, if you go super, super slow and you got the fan blasting, there's not a reason why you can't extend that till as much as that the actual mechanical strength of that because it's solidifying as it's going. So you can, you can in theory, be printing in midair. And that's something... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just like, like when you do the 3D print, printed with a welder thing, I mean, you can... Once the weld solidifies, it's you can start like that, and you can print vertically, like downwards against gravity, of course, because you're attaching that to something that's already frozen, things like that. So you have to understand some of the physical features. So so, and that's the kind of stuff we record and document. It's what makes the hardware much more complicated than software, because the compiler includes gravity. You know, gravity like g, like are you on the surface of the moon or are you on Earth? You're gonna have different conditions that would be your fork. This is our fork for lunar printing, you know. Um, it's literally like that. And this is also why I say every build has going to have different conditions that you have to document uh, and why that would take a lot of memory because you have to package all that up into one one tar ball, one ball a package. Does yep. like Yes, it does. So let's talk about that one because <laughs> When we do 3D printing, we work with meshes, which are STL files. And STL files aren't handled well within FreeCAD. Like, because they're made of multiple surfaces, you can't just like modify it easily. So typically what you do is you convert it to a solid first. There's some STL files that you can do that readily. And I explain it in one of my two five-minute videos, how to go through that process. So I've got the two five-minute FreeCAD 101 videos. You select that object and you basically turn it into a solid through a few steps in the part workbench. Um, but without that, for example, you cannot do these operations like select the face and poke a hole through it. You're going to have to convert that mesh file into a solid file first. Because the mesh, the way it appears in FreeCAD is essentially, I think a lot of times it's empty on the inside and it's just got a bunch of surfaces, so it's not a solid. It's uh, it's a bunch of polygons, and it's treated differently. So 
the way to do that is you can operate it within, as I mentioned, BlocksCAD. You can mo definitely modify it in BlocksCAD. You can poke holes and things, do the Boolean operations. Boolean meaning like subtraction, addition, uh, intersection. Uh, BlocksCAD does that well. In FreeCAD, the requirement is that you convert it to a solid first before you do that kind of stuff. But not all. You can do, you cannot do the, the padding functions, but you can do Boolean operations within FreeCAD in a part workbench. If you have two shapes within, um, where is that, part design? No, it's in part. But if you have, so say you drew up a couple of things, I, put, I just clicked on them, they appeared like at the origin there, they're probably superimposed against one another. Yeah, there's that ball that I just drew. Um, here, let's select that, yeah, that ball. But yeah, here the Boolean operations start appearing. So you can join things like, this one is, um, I think, addition. But if you, if in a tree view now, you got, so say you got the sphere and the cone, you click shift to select both of them, and all your Boolean operations now have appeared. So you can take, for example, an intersection of these right here. I'm, I'm not sure what happened there, but... Uh, something happened. Oh yeah, what happened there was I ate the top of the pyramid with what the ball intersected with it. So you do Boolean operations. You can do like, if you have a cube, you can like, you know, cut that off with a Boolean operation by doing a subtract. So that you can still do. It's more complicated within FreeCAD because you have to select the proper thing. And once you select the two things, you have to select, make sure you know which operation out of these. It's easier in BlocksCAD. Uh, to do that, but that is a common workflow. Say we got the extruder, so for example, extruder, we got STL files from the Prusa printer. They did not have open source CAD. They do not have STLs, uh, sorry, uh, step files. Uh, most people do not use FreeCAD, uh, except for Lulzbot, which is my favorite company. That's that's the 3D printing company. It's a fully open source company. Uh, Lulzbot, they provide FreeCAD files for everything. So um, the Lulzbot printers, any parts that are on that printer are in full CAD within FreeCAD because they care about it just like we do. They understand that if you have FreeCAD, now anybody can do it. Uh, for the, most of the other guys, like for example, for the extruder, we don't have that in, in FreeCAD or step file. We have only STLs, which means we cannot do the, the various operations. We can only do like the Booleans here, but we can. So the way I did that screw hole, because that screw hole, that little tiny screw hole for the back mounting plate, I, I put that in there. And that's simply subtracting that hexagon from that shape. And that did work within the Boolean operations here. So um, that is a common workflow. So with that said, like any questions on that, uh, where we are on, I mean, that basic workflow, um, you, can, you can definitely design the carriage pieces. You'd say, OK, how do I do that half cylinder in there? Well, how do you do that? Well, if you look at the short side, you can draw on a face of that. A circle and a circle will eat all the way through to make a partial cylinder. So you have to think, kind of think about, well, how do I, what are the primitives inside there, and how do I logic that out to make it happen using simple operations? Um, and it's kind of like creative exercise. But I mean, you know, elementary school children can do that. Blocks CAD is designed for people like down to like elementary and stuff. Ask a question. Yeah. Uh, one question I had was. When you're finishing up a product and you're putting constraints on it, yeah. I guess, like, could you add a little more detail about, like, how many constraints you add? Like, for this hexagon, would you constrain yeah. every single length? Or yeah. Or angles, or how many constraints? Yeah. You can do just about all of them. And it depends where you are, so you have to play with it. But, but in a hexagon, what do I need to know? I need to know that it's going to fit my bit. And, you know, the sides, if it's... The two design constraints there were, I want the sides to be parallel for a small hole and a big hole, so I, I did that. So what were all the constraints? One, the dimension of it, so just the dimension across the two points. Before that, I already drew the hexagon, and the hexagon had all equal angles and everything, so that's already there. And the only other thing, I need to center it, so that's going to be a constraint where the center of the my hexagon is the same as the other center. And... What else? The angle I did by making the sides parallel, I made the side vertical. 
So three constraints essentially. If you don't need to do any more, don't do it. Um, however, uh, sometimes there's, and I'm not sure, because I, I typically erase my constraints, don't have enough experience with it, but they say that unless you've got every single thing constraints, if, if there's degrees of freedom, and let's look at, look at that. So say we take a look at the model and take this sketch. It has this thing called, uh, like I think, solver messages here. Um, I think it says there, I can't read that. It might say like fully constrained or there's there's missing constraints. And I think the way FreeCAD works is when there are missing constraints, it can crash easier. But then again, in my sketches, like if you do a simple sketch, you extrude it. Uh, as long as you do the merge workflow where you're putting one file into the next, the merge never crashes. If you get like a one single file that's got all these parts in it, it tends to crash more. So you want to separate it, but do minimal constraints whenever possible. And if you really need it and it's crashing on you, just get rid of all the degrees of freedom and constrain it. Because uh, sometimes, for example, one thing where it does come in, okay, you did a perfect complicated shape. You want to pad it and it says error. Uh, it'll actually tell you like not point, maybe like tells you points aren't, it's not a closed shape, but it might not. So one, just the other day, I was doing stuff, and it's like, okay, it wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't extrude out. I'm like, what's going on? All the po points are, visually, everything looked okay, but it's, it, I think what was happening there was one point wasn't closed onto the last one, so that failed. So that's where you want to have, okay, make sure everything, like, the two last points are constrained definitely, because that could either just not work or maybe crash or something like that. So in theory. Um, Setting all the constraints is good in practice. I mean, if you've got a complicated shape like the hexagon uh, or something that you drew up, I mean, a freeform shape that you drew up to constrain everything is a lot of work. Uh, why do it if you don't have to? So I would say for practical purposes, avoid it if you can. And if we're doing reverse engineering work, like say that valve and we want to draw that handle, we're just tracing over it by looking at the imported image and we're just uh, redrawing it. Uh, yeah, you're going to have a bunch of lines. You can do freehand, but you don't want to constrain all of them. Um, no need to. So a lot, it takes a lot of work. So, Alex? I have one more question. Yep. Um, I was wondering what your save sequence looks like. Yeah. When I was working with that, it crashed a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I did, it doesn't take a lot to do control save. I, I like to do that every few minutes. Like if I if I just did something that took me like 30 minutes or a minute to actually draw up intently, just save it. Control S. I don't want to lose that minute. Uh, it's at that level. Like it's just for safety. It does do auto save. I, I think you might be able to set those settings. I'm not sure. Uh, but I, my workflow is just Control S every time I've added something that's worth keeping. <laughs> Which I mean, if you've got a complex design, you might be thinking about it for a long time. So typically it's not an issue. It's say, like, okay, you figure it out, you draw it, just c click Control Save right after. Uh, make sure you, you don't crash, because for one thing you can be okay. You're trying to work out another detail. It takes you a bunch of time, so it might be like a long time before I actually do something in a CAD. So yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Does the uh, the OSC Linux have uh, customized hot buttons for the commands? No, not not so much. There's a thing called macros in here. You can actually record a sequence of steps if, if, to do something. Uh, yeah, don't really want to get into all of that, but you've got macros and ability to write little programs and make new workbenches here. Like the workbench that we have here, like part design, sketcher, we're working on one that's for the 3D printer, which what it does is you click on that and the icons that appear here uh, that's that will be in, in our next release of the OSE Linux, but we have a thing where you click on 3D printer workbench. It has the icons, the frame, the axes, and you simply click on that and it will drop that into the the picture. So you can do that very easily. So Bhakti was working a little bit on that. We've got some people on the team that um, have begun that process. We actually did a complete uh, PVC workbench. You can generate any kind of PVC pipe or whatever. Uh, corner like 
T's, like crosses, elbows. That's actually very useful. I mean, nobody has that out there, so we did it because we use a lot of PVC and we want to have any kind of variation we need. So that, that workbench exists, and that's something you can program. So that's that shows you how useful a package like FreeCAD could be. You can put a, a design library for anything, any single thing. As long as you have the, the parts that are admissible parts, you provide also a design guide that tells you, okay, this is how things work and how they go together. Any person then can start designing real meaningful objects, and that's very powerful. So that's a capacity that we have and it's not, not happening because it's a capacity that exists, but we need to generate those part libraries and resources that make it practical. And first is like learning FreeCAD, making, you know, FreeCAD is improving constantly. It's getting better and easier. And um, so there's a lot of power to what we can uh, uh, produce for the general public on that front and reinvent local production. Yeah. Uh, Alex? You Reduce the polycap, so it's in the same space. Yeah, in the, there's actually a mesh workbench within FreeCAD, and it's got things like that uh, s to simplify things that are SDL files. Okay. It does. It's kind of beyond the scope of that, but yeah, it's of this this talk here. But you do have a, a dedicated mesh workbench. Yeah, That's yeah. Other people have done things like, for example, there's a shipbuilding workbench. Some shipbuilding guy decided to put in tools for building holes, ship holes and stuff. So, so you can do that for anything, like car building workbench. You know, as long as like a lot of it is you don't know which parts to use, but if someone already told you what's admissible, when you have that, then you say, okay, we know that's engineered to work we can now use use that as a construction set. So that's how you democratize production. Because right now, all that knowledge, all your special engineers and professionals have that. And not a lot of them think about sharing that to the public. So that's a big gap in society that's there. But we can definitely address that to make life easy for everybody. So like, um, you know, like with the 3D printed fittings, there's actually a group uh, in the Solomon Islands or Australia that their 3D printing fittings are high pressure fittings, 100, 200 PSI, you know, that kind of stuff where they did it because they don't have easy access to, to fittings in the Solomon Islands. But that's the kind of stuff you can be talking about. You know, save our trip to the, to the store when we're in the middle of building the CD home and we need plumbing fittings. If we missed one part, just print it right there. But you do want to have a good printer, fast printer. Uh, you want to have experience with it. You don't want to just say, oh, like, first of all, you got to have the file. You gotta know how to print it, what you need, all of that. So, so you gotta you gotta be aware of that. But that kind of awareness is readily achievable, so that when we have our crazy builds, you, we can be just having running. You know, we can have a wall of our printers now producing all the aquaponics parts or all the plumbing, as the other team is doing other stuff, and that saves a whole bunch of time. But to develop that kind of infrastructure takes effort to do, and that's exactly what we're doing. So that's why we're all here.